All right, well, welcome back to uh, this uh, next series um, in our course, Faith Bible Institute. And uh, we're looking at the theology of God and of Christ, and we've taken a break over the holiday period, an extended break. Um, but we're going to pick back up with the notes that we had uh, from the first uh, set of sessions. And tonight we're on page 16. <clears throat> and just to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, on page 14, we were looking at, we started looking at the works of God. <clears throat> and the first one that was listed under the works of God was creation. And so that's a particular topic that we've been looking at, uh, dealing with creation. And so on the top of page 16, we're picking up with the, the thought, the question, why God created. Okay? Why God created. And <clears throat> again, there are certain questions that remain unanswered in the Bible. Um, I mean, why did he create as opposed to not create, right? He could have chosen just to not create. So why did he choose to create rather than just not create? And I don't know that there's an answer anywhere in the Bible for that. But it does explain uh, what his purpose was in creating, okay, and, and through creation. So one of those was um, having created intelligent beings like ourselves, the works of creation were also made as a means of self-revelation. And this is something we already touched on previously, so we're not going to spend a lot of time. But Psalm 19, again, talks about how just, you know, the heavens are the handiwork of God, you know, the, um, just everything that we see around us just cries out that there's a creator. And so it's a means of self-revelation. God, one of the ways God reveals himself is through his, his mighty works that he has accomplished in nature, in creation. And Romans 1, again, adds to that saying that the things that we can know about God, there are certain definite truths we can know about God just through creation, okay? His power, His infinite nature, etc. We can know those things about God just by creation. So, a means of self-revelation is one of the purposes of His created works. The other one that is stated clearly in the Bible is that He created all things for His pleasure and glory. And... Um, so let's go to Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to pick up there. Isaiah chapter 43, where there's a, a very, very clear verse that's given um, as to how we should view, or how we fit into God's creation, rather. So in Isaiah 43, verse 7, <clears throat> uh, God is the one speaking. And he says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. So God makes it really clear that every person that he has formed, uh, he did so with the goal of that person being able to know him by name and to glorify him. And I know I've, maybe you've heard this reflection, right? I've, heard, I've had people say to me, wasn't well, that a little like, you know, vain on the part of God, you know, he made all these creatures just so he could be glorified. Um, the danger in that kind of a question is we're attributing to God the foibles of man, right? I mean, men do things like that to puff themselves up. God doesn't need to puff himself up, <laughs> okay? So there's no vain glory in God, all right? So we can't attribute to him the feelings that a person would have or the, the reasoning that a person would have. Um, he is God, infinitely above us, infinitely beyond, a power we cannot even, I mean, again, he breathes out stars, you know, <laughs> he, he says a word and the universe comes into existence, I mean, this is a power we cannot even possibly fathom, and so, yes, the proper, uh, what the Bible says in Romans 12, too, it's like our reasonable service, it just is, makes sense, of course you're going to, a, to um, honor and glorify such a being as God. I mean, just the, the little that we are able to understand of him and, and capture, even if his, if his being is beyond anything that we can, you know, fully grasp, what we are able to grasp ought to just make us, you know, struck with awe. I mean, how else, how not to be? I mean, we do, we're struck with awe when we look at his handiwork, right? We see mountains, a mountain chain, and we just, oh, that's so beautiful, you know? Look at the vast ocean, oh, this is, you know? and we, we stand there in awe at his handiwork, why would we not stand at all at the one who made it, who made all those things? Um, 
Turn to Revelation now. Another interesting statement here in Revelation 14. The fact that men are not willing to... That men are so proud that they wouldn't bow down and worship such an amazing God um, just shows you how proud man is, but it's also the thing that causes man to be lost. Um, now notice what it says in Revelation 14. The context of the tribulation, and during that time, uh, one of the angels that God uh, uh, sends out, it says in Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, so here's the message this angel's proclaiming, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And so it's interesting that even until the very end, one of the, a big part of the message that's being proclaimed is the fact that when you consider God's creative work, it ought to bring us to not only fear Him, but to glorify Him, to give Him glory and to worship Him. And um, Romans says that one of the reasons that men are without excuse is because it's that having known God, they did not acknowledge Him as God, they did not glorify Him as God, neither were they thankful. And so one of the reasons men are lost is because even though they, they intuitively and inwardly know that there's a creative being, an all-powerful being, they refuse to thank Him for every good thing that, they, that He brings into their life, and they refuse to glorify Him. And the Bible says they are therefore without excuse. It's one of the reasons men are lost is because they adamantly refuse to glorify this God who made them <laughs> and in whose Hands are their very breath and every beat of their heart. Okay, um, so why did God create? Maybe he doesn't satisfy all of our curiosity, um, but God does give a pretty clear explanation for one of the, one of the distinct purposes of creating is so that uh, his glory just might be manifested and admired by his creation. All right, now the significance of God as creator. Um, and we're going to be touching on it several points tonight or maybe into next week, but um, that I just think are incredibly important, but all derive from the truth of who God is. All right? So the first one is the significance of God as creator. Because God is the creator, therefore God possesses the creation. God's not part of the creation. God possesses the creation. God is separate from the creation. He made it. Um, he possesses it. He possesses every part of it, right? Um, let's look at Deuteronomy in this case. Deuteronomy 10, 14. It's a pretty powerful text. that summarizes this truth. Deuteronomy 10, 14. So, Deuteronomy 10, 14. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. So that covered, covers it, right? So the heaven, even to the very highest heaven, down to this earth and everything on it, says it all belongs to him, every whit of it. Now, again, that's significant because if everything belongs to God, that means everything that we think we possess really belongs to him. So he does give us the, the, the joy, the responsibility, um, the means to be able to be stewards of what he's entrusted us with, but ultimately it all belongs to him. And I really, I think often this passage in um, Chronicles, if I'm thinking correctly, it's First Chronicles. I probably should have written it down. First Chronicles 29. Um, yes. So, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14. So, the context is when the, the people were giving for the construction of the tabernacle, and um, David gave also uh, 
a substantial amount of his own riches. And, uh, but he makes a statement as he's praying, starting in verse 10, he, he begins praying and, and praising God and so forth. But when you get down to verse 14 in his prayer, so 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14, David says this in his prayer, But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? Here he says, For all things come from you, and of your own we have given to you. So David's saying, you know, God, all we're doing is giving back to you what belongs to you in the first place. Um, and it's such a potent reminder because you know, sometimes we're tempted to think, you know, okay, I've got, you know, so much money in my bank account. That's my money. You know, I work for it and I've saved and I've, you know, saved and I've earned it. And so that's my money. So let's see, maybe I can, uh, maybe I can take, you know, a small percentage of that and give it to God, you know, and won't God be impressed by that, you know? So I'll give a little percentage of my money to give to God. David was like, you know, God, first of all, you've been so gracious to us. You have blessed us so abundantly. He said, but even when we give back to you, no matter what it is, even if we give, you know, a large percentage back, we're only giving back to you what is yours. So it's no real sacrifice on our part. Um, it really changes our perspective on the things, again, that we own, that we're responsible for. Um, I remember one time, this story is on my mind, when we were in France, um, there was a young Christian couple there. they gotten saved not too many months before, and... Uh, we were going to help somebody move. And so, uh, and they didn't use moving vans there usually. I mean, they could, but they would, you know, nobody had money for that or a lot of them didn't. So, so we would just bring whatever vehicles we had, you know, and somebody, especially if somebody had a, any kind of a van or, you know, a large car or whatever, just fill it up with stuff, you know. And, um, or if they had a trailer, you know, they load that up. But we're moving this guy, this one family, and we were almost done. We were almost able to pack everything in the, in the trailer and the van and the different cars that were there. And there was just like a few items left that we couldn't squeeze in. And they were like a TV and stuff that were kind of fragile. And so this one young couple was there to help. And their car had nothing in it yet. So I went over and I said, hey, um, would it be all right if, uh, Jose and Valerie, would it be all right if um, we just put these couple items in your car? Well, it was a new car. And he's like, no, no, that's not all right. I, like, I thought he was joking. So I was like, come on, I was like, <laughs> I said, just, you know, these few items, you know, we'll just set them in there carefully and just, that we can be all done moving. You know, we just make one trip and we know we have to come back and pick this stuff up. He's like, no, I, I don't want to get my car messed up. I just, you know, I just bought this two months ago, whatever. And no, we're not. And it, it just struck me, you know, I mean, he was a young Christian, you know, he just, and, uh, but he, that, that was his car, you know, and even though it would have, could have been used as a blessing for somebody else, you know, it was his car and he didn't want anything to happen to it. Um, and that's the mentality we can fall into, right? Um, and so we've got to be mindful, you know, our homes, our cars, uh, our money, um, it's everything is given to us by God, uh, including our kids, right? Um, they're on loan to us. And, you know, we're stewards, to raise them up uh, for the Lord, but they're, they're His. All right, so God possesses a creation. That's a huge consequence of the fact that He is the Creator. Um, God sustains the creation. So not only did He create, but He's the one who continually, actively sustains it. And so, um, I don't know, there's just a number of passages. Let's look at Colossians. Colossians 1.17 Colossians 1.17, and here it's talking about Jesus specifically, who was also creator, um, because the whole Trinity was involved in creation. But And um, in Colossians 1.17, it says, And he, referring to Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things consist. Okay, Things are held together. Things continue to operate as they do because the Lord is actively working um, through creation. Hebrews, the other passage that listed there, Hebrews 1.3, again has the same idea. Hebrews 1.3, which says, again referring to Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Upholding. Okay, all things in him consist. He upholds all things through his power, it says, through the word of his power. 
Um, and again, that's important because there's a lot of different uh, theories, I guess you could call them out there, false teachings really. But I was in a, in a seminar one time being taught by a Jewish rabbi, and this particular Jewish rabbi anyway said that his view, and the view of a certain number of Jews, is that God kind of got things started at the beginning, and he said, okay, now you're all on your own. And he's not involved with his work anymore. And the, the man even says, so now it's up to us. You know, whatever is going to come out at the end, it's going to be up to us, not to him. He just kind of got things started, but then it's, he got, he's, his hands are off of it now. It's like, wow, you know, what a deficient view of God and of his work now in, in making creation, but then in sustaining it. Um, but it's the same idea, too, for those who think that man can destroy God's work without God being the one who allows it. So like, for example, the Bible says that um, God judged the world once by water, right, through the flood. He says, but now, he, he promised he would not do that again, but now he says he's pre preserving the world until the day of judgment when it will be judged by fire. But God says he's sustained it. This world is not going to be destroyed until God says it's time. <laughs> and it's going to only happen in the way that he's designated. So again, he is very much active in creation at all times. And as we know, there's, you know, that's, a, that's a, an encouraging truth as well because, again, God does care and is involved in every detail of his creation. Like the Bible says, the hairs on our head are numbered. I mean, we matter to him immensely. Every detail of our life matters to him. And so thankful, yes, he is involved in creation and continues to work through creation and in us through all that, so... Um, God rules the creation. We're going to come back to this a little bit later on, but let's look at the passage in Acts 17. Acts 17, verse 24. God rules the creation. He's the one over all things. Even though the Bible says Satan is the prince of the power of the air, um, there's one above him. Okay, So he has a certain freedom uh, to affect things, but God is still far above him. Act, yes, what I do? <laughs> Yeah, you know, thank you. Trying to brainwash us to be so scared that the earth's going to fall apart. Thank you. We don't need to be afraid. Is that was my wife that made that comment, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's exactly true. Uh, that's a that's a, um, an important um, principle that comes out of that truth. Yeah. Acts seventeen twenty four says, "God who made the world and everything in it." Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He rules over his creation. Um, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Man's obligation to God, therefore. So in light of this fu fundamental truth, okay, that God is creator, created everything, sustains everything, etc. Then what is our obligation to him? Well, we've already noticed the one that says we're to get, praise Him and give Him glory. Um, it is our reasonable service to do that, to acknowledge who He is. Uh, we read also in Revelation about we're to fear Him, a, a proper, um, holy fear of God. Um, we're to worship Him. Let's go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, it's an invitation to worship Him based on the fact that he is the creator. Psalm 95, verses 3 to 6. Psalm 95, verses 3 to 6. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Again, when we know, and no, I, one of the most powerful experiences in life, I think, is to see a child being born. And it moves me when I see, like, you know, uh, you know if, there's, if somebody filmed a child being born and you can watch it, it's moving, but when it's your own child, you know, that is just like so powerful. But as you're watching this thing happen, it's like, 
but this is beyond me. I didn't, you know, we're not capable of doing this. You know, I mean, we were part of what happened, part of the process, but this is God's work. I mean, it's so obvious. It's just so miraculous. This life, this little body being born, it's fantastic. And um, so knowing that, knowing that he made us, um, the, the normal, clear reaction should be to bow down and worship him. Right? And then to trust him. As we pointed out, and as like Lori just said, there's no need to fear. We can trust him because he does care for us and he's promised to provide for us. It's a passage in Matthew there where he says, you know, why are you concerned? Why are you anxious about what you're going to eat and drink? Why are you anxious about what you're going to wear? Those are the things the pagans worry about. Yeah, people that don't know God or don't want to acknowledge him. Yeah, they, of course, they're worried about that. But those of us who know God as our maker and as our sustainer, um, he says, I know all these th things that you need. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And he's very faithful to do that. So we can trust him, even in difficult times, even when we don't see how we're going to get through this month and pay our bills, when we don't see how things are going to come out at the end, we can trust him and all that. Okay, so, uh, yes, that was the, the first work of God that we were looking at was creation. Now, on you know, the bottom page 16, sovereign rule. Sovereign rule. Um, so God not only is the creator, he is the ruler. So if you're still in Psalm, um, Psalms 93 now. Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And so it starts out by saying the Lord reigns. He's sitting upon his throne in majesty. Uh, I like this um, quotation that says uh, from a the, um, theologian named Burkhoff, he rules as king in the most absolute sense of the word and all things are dependent on him and subservient to him. So, to expound upon that, um, that he is the sovereign ruler, let's look at some different points here. First of all, bottom page 16, God is king over all creation. And so, Psalm 99, verse 1, while well, we're still in the Psalms, Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. All right, so the, God is king over all creation. I'm reading the notes now. Everyone and everything is subject to his authority and will. His perfect will is accomplished perfectly in his perfect time. Okay, so there's a little, little redundancy there, but uh, uh, desired. Okay, his perfect will is accomplished perfectly in his perfect time. I think often of that passage in Galatians 4, 4, where it says, in the fullness of time, he sent his son. Um, in the fullness of time. You know, why did God wait? You know, we don't know exactly how many years from creation to when Jesus was born, but, you know, it was several thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, whatever it was. But why did God wait several thousand years to send Jesus? You know, after Adam and Eve sinned, he could have sent Jesus, you know, in the next generation. Um, he could have sent him at any time. And all it says is, in the fullness of time. That is, God knew the exact right moment in history. And I've heard some people uh, expand on that, why they think that that was the right time, and I think there's, I think there's some good insights about that. Um, but be that as it may, all we know is that God knew what the exact right time was for Jesus to come into the world. And he said, here he comes. He will be born at that moment. Um, he rules over all creation. Everything is subject to him. His perfect will is accomplished in his perfect time. Look at Daniel 4.35. Daniel 4.35. Daniel 4.35. It says, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does, God, does according to his will 
in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Hmm. So again, it makes it clear whether we're talking about the host of heaven or we're talking about, um, you know, here on earth, the Bible says no one can restrain his hand. So again, he rules sovereignly over all. So let's turn the page. Top page 17, just to again develop this thought a little further. So God rules over all creation, over mankind, including over the invisible world. And so there's several different passages. There's extended passages there in Psalm 148 that elaborates on that. Okay, it talks about different spiritual beings, the different kinds of angels and so forth, and says that God rules over all of them, um, as well as over evil, that is, even the invisible evil forces that exist. God is sovereign over them as well. Uh, let's turn to Jude 6, for example. Familiar passage, I'm sure. But in Jude 6, we have this reminder, of, again, of God's sovereign rule, even over evil forces that exist. Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So God is in control there. Okay? And um, these uh, demonic beings don't escape his power. Okay? They're not just going out there doing whatever it is they want. Um, he is, again, sovereign over all that. Anything that they are allowed to do, it's only with his well, we're going to see this in a minute, but uh, um, his permissive will. But All right, um, continue to read there. He rules over civilizations and kings. Uh, different passages talk about that. John 19 is when Jesus was before Pilate, and he, Pilate, he says to Pilate, you would have no authority, no power over me that hasn't been given to you from on high. It's like, wow. I remember uh, one time I was reading that passage, and it just struck me. It's like Jesus was before Pilate to be judged, and yet Jesus completely turned the tables there and says, you know what, Pilate? <laughs> You're the one answering to the real judge right now by what you decide to do. He said you would have no power at all if it weren't given to you from on high. And uh, very quickly, I think Pilate be became aware of the fact that he was not the one judging. He was the one being judged. But um, um, let's turn to uh, Romans 13.1. Just an important reminder because this comes up all the time. I was just talking to somebody just yesterday about this. Um, you know, uh, why should we obey authorities um, when so many authorities are corrupt? And it's, it's, a, it's a valid question. I mean, it's a logical question anyway. Not a biblical one necessarily, but it's a logical question. Romans 13.1 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Okay, that's pretty power. That's that's pretty straightforward, right? So there is no authority, no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And yet we know when these words were written that uh, Nero and his cohorts were in power. Then you know, I mean, he was a nut, and uh, and yet Paul, you know, God inspired Paul to write these words. Yet even Nero was operating under God's sovereign control, and God was allowing for his purposes and reasons for this man Nero to be in power. And so they were to be in subjection to him. And so today, no matter who it is in the White House, um, you know, even when they pass laws and then ask us to pay taxes to fund you know, uh, corrupt um, programs, uh, abortion, or you know, teaching, uh, you know, who knows what in public schools. Um, and there's so many things we can object to on the moral grounds and be right about it, and we should object to it. And yet God says we're to be subject to those authorities, again, not going along with their wicked, you know, deeds, but still we need to obey laws and pay taxes. Even when we would have moral grounds to say, I don't want to pay taxes for this because it's going to go to this very... Um, uh, corrupt cause or this very immoral cause, and yet God says, no, you pay taxes to whom taxes are due, and just a few verses on. 
So uh, kind of mind boggling sometimes, you know, to, to reconcile these things. Um, but it's because God is sovereign. That's the reason that we can be subject to the authorities even when they are corrupt because God overrules them. And, uh, and he, we're going to see in a minute, he uses even evil men to accomplish his purposes. We're going to look at that also in just a minute. Um, and then finally, God also is sovereign over, he rules over the affairs of each person. And so Proverbs 69, it says, was it, man devises his way, but God directs his steps. Am I saying that right? I think it's something like that. Um, man has his plans for his life, but it says, but God directs his steps. So, um, and how many times, right? We had plans that went awry, or I mean, or at least were changed <laughs> significantly uh, from what we expected because God overruled. And God is in control of all circumstances that we're not in control of. So, um, any thoughts up to there? Seen a lot of stuff. Any other thoughts about that section? Now, the next point, his rule is absolute, kind of goes along with what we've been saying. Okay, his rule is absolute and good because God is good. His overall overarching rule is good, which is why Romans 8.28 there in the notes is such a powerful statement and promise that all things, it says we know, for we know that all things work together for good. How can we know that? Because we know the one who is over all things, and he is good. So while certain circumstances that we go through don't look very good at all, and sometimes are the result of evil action by evil people, yet we can still trust God in that, because God is able to bring good even through the evil actions of others. And so we can trust him that his overarching plan is good. And so, like it says in the text, we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All those things in some way, some form or another, are going to work out for the very best, for what is absolutely good. And then the next point, God is sovereign because he is omnipotent, so no one can resist him. He is sovereign because he's omniscient. He knows all that will or could happen. And he's sovereign because he is Lord of all. Now, I just want to develop that thought about his omniscience. That God's omniscience isn't just knowing everything that is. God's omniscience includes everything that could be or that could have been, I should say. So he knows not only the actual facts and choices that people make, he knows all the alternative facts and choices that people could have made and where they would have led. He knows everything. I mean, that's, a, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard enough to contemplate that he knows everything, you know, I mean, about every detail of the universe. I mean, that's mind-blowing. But then they could also know all the the infinite number of options, other options of what could have happened. And there are verses in the Bible where he talks about that. Um, did I actually put some in there? No. But, you know, for example, he'll say, uh, um, uh, after he was in certain cities ministering, and then he condemns them, you know, Capernaum. He says, Capernaum. If the miracles had happened here at Capernaum, had happened in uh, Sidon or Tyre, he says, they would have repented long ago. So he's giving up something that could have happened, it didn't, but he knows what would have happened in that case. And so he throws it out there saying, I know what would have happened. If those same miracles had been performed elsewhere, there would have been a different reaction than what there is here. And um, so God knows all those different options out there, and yet he is sovereign over all that, and his plan will be accomplished in the end. Um, now, also, it says he's sovereign because he's Lord of all. And so, you know, we're told in uh, Philippians that at the name of Jesus, you know, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Again, it's so obvious. I mean, just it's for any thinking person, it's just so obvious 
who God is as creator, as Lord. And it, it ought to just, it's hard to imagine how people can resist um, the, the obvious reaction, which is just to bow down before him and, and, to, and to worship him. And yet so many don't right now, but the Bible says the day will come when they all will. The day will come when every knee will bow. Sadly, for many, it will be in judgment. Sadly, for many, it will be too late. But the day will come when every knee will bow and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. And so, finally, to close this section out, only because God is sovereign can we be assured that His Word will always come to pass. Okay? The reason, again, these... Doctrine is important is because doctrine spills over into real life, <laughs> okay? And it, it is what sustains us in the midst of the craziness of life, right? And that what seems to be the unfairness of life so many times and the surprising circumstances that arise. It's because God is sovereign that we can be assured that His Word will come to pass. Always. Inevitably. And again, that should bring us great comfort in the midst of you know, all the chaos around us, in the midst of you know, all those who are opposing God. He will come out on top at the end, having accomplished His perfect plan like He laid it all out. Um, let's look at a couple of verses here. Psalm, 1, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Verses 89 and 91. Psalm 119, 89 to 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances for all are your servants. So he says, because God's word is settled forever in heaven, that is why we know He is faithful. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Every generation can count on God's faithfulness because His Word is settled and will be accomplished. And that's why it's a serious matter when people um, question God's Word, even in what seems to be, when people want to be more generous than God. Um, for example, I've had people say, um, yeah, but when you... When you insist that the only way to heaven is through Jesus, when you insist and say that the only way to be saved is by believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, aren't you putting God in a box? You know, aren't you limiting God? It's like, well, first of all, God's the one who limited himself because God, Jesus said, I am the only way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if there's a box out there, he's the one that made the box, okay? And he put himself in it. But the point is, God stated that as a firm promise and as a warning to those who would rebel against them. But God stated it as a firm truth. And so if God could change that, if at the end when we get to heaven we find out, oh, look, everybody's here. How about that? You know, uh, Hitler's here. Oh, thank you. Adolf Hitler's my next door neighbor. You know, uh, Isn't that wonderful of God? If that were actually to happen, then that would mean that God, first of all, is not faithful to his word, that is, you can't trust him because he'll say one thing today very adamantly and then tomorrow do the exact opposite. I mean, what kind of God would that be? Oh, exactly. exactly. It demeans God. Yeah, it doesn't enhance God, it demeans him. So it's really important that we um, stand firmly on this truth, okay? God's word will come to pass. If he stated it, in fact, that's the essence of faith, right? In Romans 4, Paul, when he's describing faith, uses Abraham as an example and says that Abraham believed that what God said he would accomplish. So he was strengthened in his faith, believing that what God had said he would accomplish. That is what faith is, taking God at his word. That is what faith is. So if we can't take God at his word, if God can say one thing and do another, then there's, there is no faith. And there is no faithfulness on God's part, which means, again, that we are just kind of left to, you know, to chance. 
we don't know what's going to happen because God apparently can do one, say one thing and do something else. So who knows what's going to come, happen next? God said he would provide for me, but maybe I don't know that now because God can change his mind if he wants to. No, if God stated it as a promise, he will accomplish it. Um, Isaiah 55, 11. Let's look at that one. Beautiful, beautiful text. All of Isaiah 55. But Isaiah 55, 11 focuses it on this and says, God says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So again, I don't know how many different ways God can say it, right? <laughs> Whatever I say, it's going to happen. Okay, you can count on it. Okay, you can be sure of it. You can be comforted by that. Or you can be terrified by it as well. Okay, but if I said it, it's going to happen. So, again, any thoughts before we go on? Yeah. 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 That's right. Yes. Yes. So the brother is pointing out, for the benefit of those listening on video here, that uh, um, you know there, there, there can be, there are preachers out there who cherry pick was the right word um, to try to make the message more appealing or more inclusive. And in fact, they're just watering God's word. They're actually destroying the, the very nature of who God is. Yeah, the danger is probably giving that false assurance. Yep. 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 Very true. Yep. It, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. But it does. It, it creates false assurance. Yes. Romans 4. Uh, I forget the verses. Hand. Verse 11, 12, 13, 21. I think it was around the 20s, low 20s, I think. Now you, gotta, now you got me wondering now. What is it? 21. 21, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, all right, God's plan. Uh, it's 8 o'clock. I think we're going to stop. All right, listen, though. I, I do hope you'll come back because, again, we're all lead, this is all leading up to this Next section, really, God's plan, because, again, that's, that's where we get directly involved. You know? So all these truths, how does that impact me, and what does that look like for me? How do, you know, God's plan for each one of us. And there's some, some fascinating things to consider as we explore this next section. So, yeah, we didn't get very far, did we, tonight? <laughs> I don't know if we're ever going to get to the theology of Christ. We'll do our best. Um, well, let's go ahead and close with prayer, and we'll pick up. So, uh, next week, okay, Lord willing, next week we'll be meeting again. So, uh, I encourage you to come back, and hopefully a few others will be able to join us as well. But, um, all right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, uh, for just these incredible uh, truths that are in your word that you put there, Lord, because you want us to know them. You want us to build our lives upon them um, because, again, you are sovereign and you will bring these things to pass. And I'm so um, what's the word? Reassured, strengthened uh, to, to be able to know that, to know that we can trust you and to know that your ultimate and perfect plan will be fulfilled. And um, so thank you for that, Lord. And thank you that in your grace you made these things known to us. You didn't have to reveal all these different things that you do, but you made these things known so that we can uh, know you and know uh, how you're working in our lives and even working in the world around us. And uh, it does fill us with awe on one hand, but it also creates this sense of uh, assurance and comfort um, that you're in control and we can trust you. So thank you, Lord, for that. We praise you. And just ask your blessing upon each one now, Lord, as we uh, head to our respective homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much.
and we'll see you again next time.